Good morning. Welcome you here as we gather for worship. We follow the order of the service, the um, service, Lutheran Service Book 4, page 203. Um, one announcement to highlight, uh, Pastor Eccles uh, mentioned this to me, that um, still have to, if you're planning on coming to the uh, installation, ordination service, uh, and the dinner, uh, oh, just for the dinner, you have to sign up for that. Uh, so, you know, kind of like a parable of the the ten virgins, don't be the foolish virgins, be the wise ones who sign up so the door is going to be open for you. And with that, we begin uh, our service with the ringing of the bells. <clears throat> Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. Enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one will give his righteousness before you. Let me hear in the morning of all your steadfast love. For in you I trust. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. 
Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of the prophet Amos, the seventh chapter. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. The name Isaiah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus, Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. The name Isaiah said to Amos, O seer, Go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, Prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, <clears throat> the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished, lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Gospel is the Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, He is Elijah. And others said, He is a prophet, like one of the old prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. 
For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess the faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth,
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The text of our sermon meditation this day is the epistle reading of St. Paul to the Ephesian church, first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. <clears throat> in love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So far the word of God. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, we're now in a, an election cycle, are we not? And we saw some interesting things last night, some dangerous things taking place. And as we, we think about the election cycle, uh, the candidates have put their names up for election. They have signed the papers and filed the papers to get on the ballot. And as we then go to the uh, voting booths, the ballots, we check them out and check them off, choosing who we think would be the best person to lead the nation or to serve in that respective uh, office. And we think about that. <clears throat> There's so many people vying for that one top spot or many top spots, whether it would be nationally or locally. They're all vying for that place. They hope to be chosen then to represent the people of the state or the district or even the nation. There are those who want to unseat them, and they're hoping uh, to take over, to be in the place of honor. They hope to unseat that incumbent, take their place of leadership, and do things the way that they think should be done. But it all depends on one day. That one day is election day. And on that election day, the people will choose and they will serve as the, upon the will of the people. Election Day. St. Paul also talks about an election or a choosing, which is far greater and has far greater implications and blessings than any earthly office to which we desire to hold may be given to us. St. Paul speaks to us of God's election of sinners to be heirs of eternal life. St. Paul speaks of God choosing sinners, you and I, and others in this world. We are chosen to be blameless before God, to serve God's eternal purpose, to receive from Him life and salvation. And it's good for us to remember this election and the purpose that God has for our lives, because it's not we but it is Christ who's working in us and through us and bringing us to eternal life. So as we think about it, <clears throat> on earth, only one person can be chosen above all others. Only one person will receive the privilege of serving in any of those elected positions. Only one person will receive authority to exercise the duties of their elected office. And while there are many offices, only one person may fill that specific office. And moreover, that elected office has a time limit. But when we think about God's election, we must understand that it is far different from the elections with which we are familiar. God elects or chooses from eternity to eternity. He chooses us to be his own. The election is for all sinners whom God would choose, regardless of their popularity, 
regardless of the authority or power that they may wield, regardless of whatever platform they stand on. From the greatest to the least that God has chosen, he chooses them the same way. And it matters little who you are. It matters little what you have done. It matters little what people think of you. God chooses sinners in Christ to be his children, to be heirs of eternal life, to receive forgiveness of sins, and to rejoice in salvation that is earned for us through his Son, Jesus Christ. So if it's not dependent on us for this election of God, it is dependent upon another. And throughout the passage, St. Paul reminds us who that other is. There's only one word that's repeated about eight times, and it's always connected to one person. That word has great importance for us. That word is in, in Christ. The word speaks of a relationship between two things, and this relationship is both personal and enduring. For God, revealing his election of sinners, such election is in something or someone. And as St. Paul clearly says, the sinner's election by God is in Christ. In Christ. And St. Paul reinforces this in by saying, in Christ, in him, in the beloved. And therefore, the sinner's election by God is also personal and enduring. We don't have to worry about being deposed by anyone or anything in this world. Because as God has chosen us and called us to be his children, he will make us endure through all things. So how does this election take place? How does God work this choosing in our lives? <clears throat> what do we know about the third article of the creed? How has that been explained to us? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. This is God's election for us. God tells us that we come into contact with the Holy Spirit, and he comes to us and he makes us God's children. He cleanses us of our sin. But how does that Holy Spirit come to us? Only through God's means of grace. Through the word that is proclaimed, through the water of baptism that is poured over us, that is where God works and elects and chooses us to be his people. To convert us by the power of the Holy Spirit, to make us believers in this triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just as John writes, he writes in his gospel account, that Jesus said these words, unless one is born from above of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And St. Peter also says of baptism, baptism now saves you. There's no doubt with that. God works through the water and the word to make us his children. The Spirit of God is coming to us, and he sets us apart from this sinful world and gives each and every sinner the very seed of salvation and the mark of God's redemption in Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God is working through word and water, and he takes what is dead in trespasses and sins and makes it alive in Jesus Christ. What was once covered in the uncleanness of sin and worthy only of God's eternal judgment is made holy and declared to be blameless, blameless before God. The Holy Spirit comes to you. The Holy Spirit creates in you a new life. And that is what we proclaim in the worship service. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew me. Renew us. Make us your children, God. Strengthen us <clears throat> that we may hold on to the truth and the path that you have laid for us in your holy word. So in Jesus Christ, we are therefore <clears throat> blessed by God through the riches and the richness of his eternal grace. <clears throat> 
and the blessings that we receive are precious to us. Redemption in the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. This means that we are rescued from an empty way of life whose goals are self-serving and whose end is eternal judgment. Such was the way of life for the Israelites who broke God's word. <clears throat> they wanted their own way of life apart from God. The prophet of Amos, the prophet Amos very clearly warns us of God's coming judgment upon those sinners and upon us if we turn away. <clears throat> he lays before them the symbol of a, of a plumb line, a plumb line against which everything is measured. God's plumb line is his holy word. He holds that before us, and he cleanses us from our sin, and he lays before us that standard that God would have us walk by. But the children of Israel at that time, they didn't follow that plumb line. They didn't measure their lives against God's holy will, and they suffered the consequence of their rebellion. God withdrew his hand of mercy, and he replaced it with a rod of judgment and divine discipline. As Amos writes the word of the Lord, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. That plumb line is still with us today. It's the Word of God made flesh, Jesus Christ, walks among us, gathers us together, shares with us, us the blessings of, of God through the sacraments that he, he gives to us. Paul talks about this. <clears throat> he said, God desires to cover our sins with the blood of his Lamb and to make us heirs of eternal life. Paul says, the plan of God is to unite all things in heaven and on earth. Unite them in his Son, Jesus Christ. And that means all people from every age in the past, in the present, and in the future, from every age, any time, that same promise will hold true. The will of God is for the salvation of sinners. It is eternal, and it is never changing God does not say, I'm going to save this person over here and this person over there, but you know I don't want you. He does not say that. He calls all people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And we know, as Paul says, that this plan of God and his purpose was in place before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Let's consider those words for a moment. What do those words tell you? What comfort do they offer you? What hope do they place before you? And what peace do these words bring to you? These few words are very important for your faith and for your salvation. They make firm your confidence in the love of God that is upon you and in you through Jesus Christ. God knew you, God knew you in Jesus Christ before the world was created. God knew Adam and Eve that they would give up their sinless life and bring unrighteousness and judgment upon all mankind. Yet God planned from the beginning to send his son to redeem sinners the world over, to grant them faith, to grant them eternal life, to grant them salvation. And all this was in place even before one day of our lives came to be. And more than that, before this world was created. So what kind of people should we be? You, know, you might ask, what kind of people can you be? We are never to fear God's love stopping for us. God's love is for you and for me and for sinners the world over in Jesus Christ. We never need to doubt God's plan for our lives. 
When we face hardship, when we face disappointment, when we face tragedy, or even face death, this Word of God reminds us that God still loves us. God guarantees to each and every one of the people that He calls and gathers through His Word, He guarantees them eternal life. God guarantees you strength of faith to bear these things in life until God brings you home. God guarantees you His Spirit as a completion of all the promises that God offers us in Christ. Paul says, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of God. We've obtained something. We have something. God's given us something to hold on to, to give us confidence as we go through life in this world. A guarantee. Let's think about that for a minute. What is a guarantee? It's the assurance that you will rec- what you receive will remain in working order for a period of time. On earth, it's a taillight guarantee. As soon as you can't see the taillights of the car, the guarantee's gone. God has purchased us with the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Scripture also tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So His blood shed for us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We do not need to worry that God's love is not upon us as we walk by faith and keep our eyes focused on the cross and the empty tomb. This is a guarantee given to us by God, and it is far better and more beneficial for us because there's no time limit, no time limit on this guarantee that God gives to us. It's an eternal blessing from our Father in heaven. And that reminds you that your inheritance in Jesus Christ is always sure. It will never become empty. It'll never be taken away from you as you walk by faith. It will always be in force for you. And when you walk by faith in Jesus Christ, your eternal life is guaranteed. When you stumble and fall into sin, when you have despair or some other shame and vice that crops up in your life, turn to the Lord in repentance and faith, and you will still have eternal life. No one can rob you of that gift. No one can take it from you. It remains yours forever as a gift of grace in Jesus Christ. So, this is what the words in Christ mean for you. As an heir and a son of God, you are chosen by God in Jesus Christ to know and believe the saving work of His only begotten Son. You are appointed in Jesus Christ to be heirs of eternal life. You are empowered by the Spirit of God to live holy and blameless lives in the obedience of faith. And you are sealed in the water of holy baptism as God's child for time and for eternity. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life eternal. Amen.
We stand for prayer. Lord of creation, you alone can speak the word that brings peace, peace and dispels all fear. Your grace is sufficient for us in every time of need. Remember us as we take refuge in your mercy, that under your protection we may pass in safety through the trials of this world, knowing that in our weakness <clears throat> uh, your power is made strong. Teach us to be still and trust in you more and more, that the peace that passes all human understanding might bring us comfort and joy, even in the midst of the storms of life. Grant your sufficient grace to all our members, including Renee, Jordan, and Amber Fisher, Jennifer Floyd, Byron Followell, Carrie Followell, and Matt Isaac and Jocelyn Foltz. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for your ch holy church spread throughout the world. May your gospel of truth be proclaimed with great might, that many might confess you as Lord and the one true God. Guide the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod to give our church body courage and peace, that our commitment to pure doctrine and our resolve to tell others the good news of Jesus may not waver in the times of unrest and strife. Grant peace to all pastors, teachers, and other workers in the church, that they too would remain faithful to your word of truth. Be with Case and Josie Farney as they get settled into life here in Evansville and as Case prepares for his time of service as a pastor in our church. Grant all joy as you provide for the needs of our congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Rock of refuge in our every need, your Son promised us that we can cast all our cares upon you because of your great love for us. Speak your word of peace and healing to all who cry out to you for help, especially those who are sick, hospitalized, or recovering, including Frank Rinkovich, Mark Kell, Carolyn Sparks, Darlene Hatfield, Wayne Dyg, Judy Fisher, Jewel Mercer, Everett Lopez, Reed Helmer, Bonnie Lengelson, John Diekman, Eric Begeman, Corrine Diekman, Vernita Cecil, Reese Mason, Cindy Westfall, Mike Hudson, Glacey Splitdorf, James Tomlinson, Kendra, Kendra Schofstall, Charlie Biggs, Don Whaler, Beverly Horn, Jenny Walker, Ruth Bashir, Danny Lantrip, and Jim Lance. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for sparing the life of a former President Trump who suffered injury yesterday. We lay before you the life of the person who was injured. Grant healing to President Trump and that person who had suffered injury. We hold before you the families of those who lost their lives. May they find comfort in their hour of grief and loss. We pray for our nation in this time of elections. Turn our hearts from violence to peace. Grant all who uh, we are seeking to, all who are seeking to be elected to, uh, to office, grant them integrity. May we give respect to all candidates and elected officials and live in peace with all. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of life, we thank you for the gift of marriage and family. We rejoice with those who celebrate wedding anniversaries this week, including Daniel and Sharon Wright, Jason and Lisa McEwen, Steve and Marilyn Meerling, Ron and Debbie Baker, Daryl and Quintina Chapman, Eric and Jillian Carnes, and Bert and Jennifer Fiocla. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we, we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we are also bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.